Welcome back to the best of investing. I'm your I'm, I'm your host Edward Brown, and I'm in the uh, studio here. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> with uh, Mark Pond of Pacific Private Money, Brian Burke of Paraxis Capital, and our guest Neil Hennessy of Hennessy Funds. When we cut to the second trivia, tri second commercial break, we asked this trivia question. In 1978, Daryl Stingley was paralyzed by this raider, aka the assassin, who made the hit. Neil, you know the answer. Jack Tatum. Jack Tatum. That is correct. And. Uh, Brian, you had a question you were going to ask. I called first, too. <laughs> you know, uh, Neil, we were talking uh, before the break about Greece and Europe and the various uh, confusion over what's going on in those markets, but you mentioned to me that uh, you were doing some investing in Japan, and I never hear anything about Japan, so uh, what is it with Japan? Well, I, I love Japan as a place to invest some money. We have two Japan funds, uh, the Hennessy Sparks Japan Fund and the Hennessy Sparks uh, Small Japan Fund. reason I like it is everything that could go wrong in Japan has gone wrong. They have deflation. They had a market that just went from just straight down for the last 20 years. They had their banking crisis, got an aging pipe of a population. They got high debt. You just name, keep going through it. It's terrible. But one of the things about Japan is they're very resilient people. Three weeks after the earthquake, I went to Japan to Tokyo to check on my people and everything like that. And it was industry interesting because if you remember at that time, everybody was concerned about uh, Japan and how were they going to get the manufacturing back up and running when they lost 25% of their power. Within a matter of 30 days, they were able to cut their power by 25%. And the way they did it was just turn off their lights. Their offices didn't have lights during the day. If you ever been to downtown Tokyo, it looks like Times Square. They turned off all neon sites. Uh, lights, if you look down from the 29th floor of the Intercontinental, it looked eerie, but it wasn't dark eerie. You could see all they did was conserve the power and turn the lights off, and they were able to save 25%. And the ACLU didn't chime uh, in? <laughs> no, I didn't hear anything about that. But what was interesting about it is if you just step back from the picture and, and throw out all the bad news, and you think about it, those companies in Japan, you're not investing in Japan, you're investing in worldwide companies that are located in Japan, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, they're stockpiling money just like corporations in the United States are. They're making acquisitions outside of their country. So far this year, they've made over $80 billion worth of acquisitions of foreign companies, and that's over 600 different foreign countries. The government's behind them. They're going to try and cut the, the corporate rate from 41%, which is the highest in the world, to 25%. So everything's going their way. What's really interesting, if you just put all that aside, is the strongest currency that's out there is the Japanese yen and has been through this whole financial, uh, financial crisis. So you have to ask yourself the question, if Japan is in that bad a shape, why is everybody buying their currency for safety? Yeah, because it, it's stable. I mean, they're, they're also for a very safety. disciplined culture. But think about this. The way you buy the currency is through the futures markets. And the futures markets are highly leveraged. They're 10, 11, 12 to 1, just like the oil market. I will tell you something, the same thing I said about oil back in 2005 or 6. I didn't know what a high was, 150, 200 a barrel, whatever it is. I did know that at some point in time somebody was going to sell, and that was going to be getting more selling, which was going to be bet, but get more selling, and that's what happened with oil. You will see that happen with the yen. Somebody will say, enough's enough. I'm out, they're going to sell the yen, it's going to go south because of leverage, margin calls, the whole nine yards, short it, will contend, exactly. yeah. it will continue to come down. And now, just imagine, what do you think their exports are going to look like? When three hours away you have 1.3 billion people living in China, 300 million are middle class, you got 1.3 billion living in India, 300 million are middle class, we haven't even got to the Arab nations or the other places. I mean, this is just so a place be cheap, to cheap, and then they'll be able to produce a lot more and sell a lot more. Right? Well, it's interesting because when the tsunami hit, it, it people thought Japan was out of the manufacturing business. That's by far not true because if you notice, the supply chain got all messed up because they couldn't supply the parts. China was in the assembly, not manufacturing assembly. Over here in China, they were in Japan. They were making the parts that they needed to assemble. And so people learn very quickly that Japan is very powerful and will come back. It's I, I like to call it the land of the rising sun. Oh yeah, that's been used. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that one before. So um, 
Give it, let's see here. Uh, where do you see the Dow a year from now? I think you can continue to see the Dow somewhere in the 8 to 12 percent range. I mean, if you look at it right now, the Dow Jones yield is about 2.5 percent. So you really don't need much to get to 8 percent. Now all you're talking about is 5.5 percent on the upside. So you're talking 600, 700 points on the Dow in a year. That's nothing. And that's even in a slow growth economy. What, what business is, is looking for is clarity out of Washington. And we just can't get the clarity for a, a myriad of different reasons. But until we know what health care, what uh, taxes, and what rules and regulations are going to be, you're not going to see any meaningful hiring in the United States. It's just not going to happen. I know the, the Yeah, you can give us the unemployment uh, information. Uh, well, this morning, they, you know, Friday they came out with the, you know, 120,000 uh, new jobs, and, and the unemployment rate mysteriously went from 9% to 8.6%. Now, I'm not a, uh, you know, a mathematician, but I'm certainly not a magician. <laughs> and and if you t just take simple numbers, if it went from 9% to 8.6, that's 40 basis points. 40 basis points in the 9% is 4.5%. If we have 15 million people unemployed in this country, that That's would mean that we would have put 600,000 people to work. Where's the math? We put 120. So once again, it's smoke and mirrors. It's people that went off the uh, unemployment. It's people that just gave up looking for a job. Half the numbers, 60,000 of those jobs were in the retail sector, and I can almost guarantee you those are not full-time jobs and don't have benefits. So Neil, where else are you seeing opportunity in the 2012? Well, I think it's it's all about necessities. I mean, if you think about it, uh, low-end retail we've been on for a long time. Uh, people are still going to have to buy clothes, so you might as well go to a Ross. If you're going to buy your niece a twenty uh, a sweater, why pay $100 at Nordstrom's? You pay $20 at Ross. Uh, you can look at Dollar Tree, you can look at Family Dollar. If you have absolutely no money, you go to Dollar Tree, everything's a dollar. If you got $10 or around there, you can go to a Family Dollar. So the low end is going to continue to do well. That's why Walmart's going to continue to do well because people have actually switched their buying habits. At the same time, they're doing more themselves. They're cutting their own lawn. So you look at a tractor supply, they sell that. And the interesting part about that is people feel good after they do it. They look and they say, well, that wasn't too difficult. And then they have a, 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 an pride achievement of pride, yeah. pride of ownership. And so that's happening. So low-end retailers are a great place to be. The other thing that I say is, is you look at necessities, you can look at utility companies. On average, the utilities are yielding four and a quarter percent. Now you take four and a quarter percent and you know that these are reoccurring revenues and they're predictable, predictable, predictable re revenues. And you're getting four and a quarter percent versus 30-year U.S. government bond paying you three percent which was mean to get the equivalent yield, those utilities would have to go up 30% to get down to a 3% yield. And everybody asked me, Hennessy, you know, utilities are bored, it's boring, or widow and orphan stocks, things like that. Let me tell you something. Cash you still rate. need to turn on your heat, you need to turn on your lights, things like that. But what's also interesting about it is, and I think all of you guys are agree, you don't care if you buy, you know, um, a nice source or a pg e you don't care, or Microsoft, as long as it goes up 30%, right? You don't really care. It's all about the money, right? So here you get income, you get safety, you get predictability, and people need it. Yeah, you're not going to probably see too much growth, but you'll see the income. And Neil, but what the growth, yeah. forget about the growth. See, people mix that with appreciation. You're looking for the appreciation of the stock. They can grow like, like a weed, but if nobody really cares, nobody's going to buy stock, so it doesn't go anyplace. So the whole idea is people will, at some point in time, get tired of getting zero in the bank okay. and buy you something. Okay, before we forget, how do people get a hold of you? Um, we're in Nevada, California. You can just Google us, Hennessy Funds. Um, you know, and we're all over the place, so it's just really Hennessy Okay, you gave us a lot of good information, and I'm sure a lot of listeners are going to be interested to uh, check you guys out and see about possibly investing with you. you got some excellent information. Here is our third and final trivia question. In 1994, the Raiders' Napoleon McCallum, his career was cut short when his knee was bent backwards by this 49er, whose father was a professional boxer, who made the hit. The first three callers with the correct answer won a free three-day, two-night stay at Lighthouse Resort. Again, their, light, their website is lighthouse4fun.com. Call 888-912-1190. That's 888-912-1190 to answer this question. In 1994, the Raiders' McCall Napoleon McCallum's career was cut short when his knee was bent backwards by this 49er 
whose father used to be a professional boxer who made the hit. Call 888-912-1190. Make sure to include your name, address, email address, and phone number, and we'll be right back.